Mary the First reign in 10 minutes, so the Lady Jane Grey usurpation. To begin with, when Edward VI was dying in early 1552, he needed to ensure that there was a succession in place for when he did kick the bucket and someone else had to rule for him. Now he had several problems, the first being he obviously had no children, he was 15 years old and unmarried, and his sister, the next person to essentially, or his half-sister to take the throne, was Mary I. And there were two problems with her, one was that she was a woman, which you didn't want, you wanted a man to rule at this point, and she was Catholic, and of course Edward was strictly Protestant, and he wanted the country to remain Protestant. So Northumberland, his chief counsellor, persuaded him to appoint his daughter-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, as successor. Now first, in the document called The Devise, he actually had the male heirs of Lady Jane Grey um, becoming the, uh, the future kings of England, but Lady Jane Grey was only 15 years old, and like Edward, had no heirs. So she became the next person in the line of succession, but this hadn't been ratified by Parliament, which you had to have an act of succession to make this legal, so technically this was all illegal and can be seen as a coup or a rebellion on Northumberland's part. However, Mary is invited to uh, London on the premise of come and see your dying brother before he, you know, he finally goes, but she's informed that this is actually a trap set up by Northumberland, so she flees to East Anglia, where of course in East Anglia people didn't like Northumberland because he had ruthlessly put down Ket's rebellion. So the people there were more pro-Mary as well as being more Catholic. Now on the 10th of July, Lady Jane Grey was crowned the Queen of England, but by two days later, on the 12th of July, Mary had already assembled an army of 10,000 strong at Framlingham Castle. On the 19th of July, Northumberland had marched out to meet this army, but he found he couldn't gather enough men to deal with it, and while he was on the road from London, he stopped over in Cambridge, um, the Privy Council in London lost their nerve and they surrendered essentially to Mary, and by the 19th, Lady Jane Grey had been deposed, and on the 1st of October, Mary had been crowned Queen. So let's have a look at the government of Mary. So the Privy Council were, of course, implicated in Northumberland's coup, they went along with it, and quite a few of them were Protestants back from Edward VI reign who obviously wouldn't like the direction that Mary was going to take the country in. However, she did have a strong Catholic presence at the heart of her council, her sort of special close advisors. Now, some of the first things she did was to release a few people who had been imprisoned, Edward Courtney. He was actually a close relative of Mary, as well as the Duke of Norfolk, who was a devout Roman Catholic, and of course, Bishop Stephen Gardiner from the Tower of London. As well as this, Reginald Pole, who had been in exile in Italy, was invited to come back, and he was actually a papal legate, and she made him the Archbishop of Canterbury after burning Thomas Cranmer alive at the stake. Um, and they were all close advisors with a strong Catholic presence. Now, as well, she was closely advised by the Spanish Imperial Ambassador Simon Renard, so the close connection to both the, um, the crowns of Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. Now let's have a look at some of the religious policies because this is what Mary is really famous for. So Mary actively wanted to start the Counter-Reformation to reconvert England back to the Roman Catholic faith. Now in the early 16th century, Martin Luther kicked off the Protestant Reformation to reform the Catholic Church and to start off essentially uh, his new churches of Protestantism. The Counter-Reformation was the Catholic response to this to try and stop this from happening. She repealed the Acts of Supremacy and Uniformity, which were these um, Protestant acts that had been done under Henry VIII and Edward VI. So the Act of Supremacy or the Acts of Supremacy were the ones that made him, so Henry or the monarch of the country, the supreme head of the church. She also reintroduced the heresy laws, which allowed her essentially to kill people for their beliefs if they were of the wrong belief, um, which she did to 300 Protestant men and women who were burnt at the stake, famously bishops like um, Hugh Latimer, as well as the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, and many of the people she burnt were actually from common humble backgrounds in the southeast. And as well, Reginald Pole, the Archbishop, managed to recruit a lot of priests in the north, so it very much depended on where in the country you were for how successful or how Protestant or how Catholic people were. In the north, for example, in the Diocese of Durham, no one was burned at the stake because the people there were still Catholic, devoutly Catholic. Now let's have a look at some of the foreign policy. Now Mary wanted to marry a Catholic to produce a Catholic heir to stop her Protestant half-sister Elizabeth succeeding and reconverting the country, essentially, um, 
countering the counter-reformation that Mary wanted. So she proposed to marry um, Prince Philip II of Spain, the son of Charles V, who was both the King of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor. But Parliament was staunchly against this. They didn't want a Spaniard coming over and ruling for them because Mary was a woman. If she married, the king would then have possession over her and over the nation. So then you'd have a Spanish king in England. Now they'd seen what the Spanish had been doing in the Netherlands with the Inquisition, which had been going since 1521, and they didn't want that in England. However, Mary signed sort of a compromise, the Spanish Marriage Treaty, which essentially said that Philip wouldn't have any of the power over her in England, so essentially he wouldn't be able to do anything in England without Mary's consent first, and they were married in 1554. Now Spain was at war with France, although the marriage alliance promised that English troops wouldn't be used to fight in Philip's father's wars against the French. Now, Pope Paul IV was elected in 1555. He hated Archbishop Reginald Pole, and of course, he was anti-Spanish because he was pro-French. So there were two reasons there that the sort of counter-reformation essentially failed because uh, the Pope was against Mary because of these political maneuverings. Now, Philip did actually persuade Mary to enter the war with France in 1557 after the death of Charles V, because of course, the clause had been that um, they couldn't use troops in or oh actually i think they, they just broke the the terms of the the treaty of the spanish marriage um treaty there that they just sent in troops anyway but the reason being was that the french had backed a plot to overthrow mary by thomas stafford to seize scarborough which had failed as well as one by henry dudley the, co the cousin of the duke of northumberland and the english finally and definitively definitively lost calais to the french during this war now let's have a look at the economy and society so mary's reign was plagued with hardships, including very dry summers, which then led to failed harvests. And this failed harvest of people were weaker, their immune systems were worse, led to bouts and epidemics of influenza, which was a terrible disease back then. Now, the collapse of the Antwerp uh, cloth trade during this time as well, starting in around 1549, I believe, made the East Coast especially hard hit. The East Coast was also where the most Protestants were, so there was a religious tension. There was now economic tension because that had also been where, of course, you had the agrarian rebellions of Ket's Rebellion against Enclosure, that with the collapse of the Antwerp, the cloth trade, most of the people in the East were no longer making money. So this made it really a hotbed for rebellion. Mary, however, tried to counter things like this by doing a lot of poor relief, especially in the worst affected regions. Um, and really, it wasn't all doom and gloom, though, because despite the debasement of the currency, which had already been happening in Edward's reign, um, and the war that Mary was kind of dragged into by the Spanish, she did reform the system of taxation, and they never fell into serious debt despite the war which is an achievement. Now, the only rebellion of Mary's reign um, was caused directly by the protest to the Spanish marriage in 1554, which, of course, people were very much against. Now, originally, several risings were planned at once, but the plot was foiled and only Thomas Wyatt and 3,000 men rose in Kent. Now, it's important to remember about this rebellion that the target, the aim of at least the leaders and a lot of the people involved wasn't to overthrow Mary. They just wanted to make a point so that she wouldn't marry um, Philip. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because, well, one of the other people who was involved was someone I've already mentioned, Edward Courtney family of the Queen and released by the Queen. Thomas Wyatt as well claimed to have fought for the Queen um, against Northumberland. So these were people who might be seen as being more loyal to the Queen who really just wanted her to change her mind. And there were several motivations. One you could have obviously was religion. Many of the people were from the southeastern, I think the town of Maidenhead is somewhere where a lot of them were from. And these were Protestant poor towns. Obviously, Mary was a Catholic, so that was some point of contention there. As well, the poor economic situation, as I've mentioned in the southeast, the gentry classes were the ones who profited most from enclosure, and they'd be especially hard hit, as well as anti-Spanish sentiments. Now, the rebels reached London, but the populace of London, who had come and supported Mary at the start of her reign trapped them inside the city and Mary was saved at the 11th hour. All right, so let's take a look at the five-point timeline here. And obviously, Mary's reign was six years long, so it really hasn't been too hard to choose these years, but let's go through them anyway. So 1553 is the start of Mary's reign after defeating Northumberland and the Lady Jane Grey coup. 1554, that's the year of the Spanish marriage and the treaty there to allow the marriage to Philip, which occurred, and then Wyatt's rebellion in response. 1555 is when the first burnings of Protestants begin with the um, heresy laws being reintroduced in the election of the anti-Spanish 
Pope Paul IV. In 1557, England enters the Spanish War with France and loses Calais permanently. And in 1553, okay, sorry, that should be 1558, uh, Mary dies. Alright everyone, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this video about the reign of Mary the I hope I haven't gone through too quickly. Um, and the next one should be out in three days time again, which will be on Elizabeth, her half-sister. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.